Hi, Zach. So, first things first, I saw your videos and finally, yeah, finally got to a place where I could download them. Now, after that, I gotta say, here's your Christmas present. I know how much you like Corvids, so here is a Pied Crow. And also, since the kids kept shouting, Ijan Gome, Ijan Gome, Ijan Gome, here's the Pied Crow as a cat. Now, I know you already know a little bit about Pied Crows, but just to recap, they're a kind of crow that are pretty common in the Gambia. They're notable for their white breasts. They also have some bit of white on their back. And another thing that's interesting about them is that they're a little bit bigger than the crows that you can find in America. In fact, they're big enough to the point where when I talked to my host sister-in-law about it, the first thing she said was that they were bad because they would sometimes carry off small hens. Yeah, these crows are predators, not just scavengers. Although, for the most part, they do seem to be scavengers. In fact, when I came out this morning, I found a bunch of vultures in my yard, along with pied crows. And also, as another just awesome thing I got to witness, in the field beside my yard, I saw an entire flock of guinea fowl chasing off a pied crow that had fallen out of a tree while fighting another pied crow. That's that's just awesome. Seeing the guinea fowl's reaction, the way that songbirds treat hawks in the United States really convinces me that, yeah, Binta is right. These things are predators, and these things do carry off small birds. So yeah, regarding what I've been up to, I was actually in the hospital this week. On New Year's Eve, while I was watering my garden, I just was overcome with this feeling in my gut and ended up having major diarrhea, throwing up over seven times in a few hours to the point where there was nothing left and kept going. I was then taken to a hospital in Combo, the capital area, and fed through an IV drip for a few days. What I'm told is that it was food poisoning. Honestly, I'm not sure what food did it to me. The food that seems like far and away the most likely candidate, given the time frame at least, is food that I have been eating regularly, so that's a bit nerve-wracking. But other than that, at least some interesting differences we can talk about in the culture. One really big striking difference between the Gambia and the United States is uh, the way people approach sick people. The way people treat sick people, that is. And that is, in the United States, we tend to give them their space. We tend to want to allow people to relax, recuperate, be by themselves, and not infect other people. But in the Gambia, how people treat sick people is they want to come forward, they want to spend time, show that you're loved and appreciated and help you out as much as you can. This was something I had heard about before experiencing it, but honestly now that I've experienced it, I can appreciate it. I ended up hurling multiple times on my floor, unable to make it to my pit latrine, and I'm very happy to have had my family members there to clean it up for me. So let's talk about your video. First things first, Turn your phone sideways, you amateur. Second thing second, it got me really thinking about poverty. There are differences in poverty between America and the Gambia. One thing that a lot of Gambians are under the impression of is that America is this country of wealth and prosperity. And while in a lot of ways that is blatantly true, one thing that comes to mind in me as a clear example is how much we rely on machines. Living in the Gambia has made me realize just how much we rely on technology for everything. The amount of times where somebody has asked me about something and I have thought, oh, we use a machine to do that, is astounding, and that shows just how wealthy our nation is. That said, one striking difference in the poverty of America versus the Gambia is, in the Gambia, I don't think I've seen a single homeless person since I've been here. There have been a few beggars and some people who may have been homeless, but to my knowledge, uh, yeah, I have not seen any. And that may also be my own ignorance, but I do get the distinct impression that homelessness is not by any means a problem in the Gambia. One of the big reasons for that, I think, deals with exactly what you said. People who don't have a lot tend to give a lot. That's true in Bozeman, that's also clearly true in the Gambia. It is an extremely hospitable place to live. People take people in all the time, whether they belong to their family, whether they don't belong to their family. There is a woman who works for the Peace Corps. There is a man who she refers to as her son, but that said, isn't related to her at all, is literally just somebody who didn't have a home that she took into her 
home and raised as her own child when she was like 16 or something. People are extremely like welcoming and being willing to welcome people into their homes and into their lives and take care of one another. The Gambia is very forthcoming in that regard. And for that reason, I am under the distinct impression if you don't have a home in the Gambia, you can find one. Another big difference comes with cost of living. Well, I'm not sure how much certain living expenses are, like I don't know how much it costs to make a house. As I've shown you before, building things is actually a very expensive and uh, arduous process. But regarding cost of living in other ways, the Gambian Delasi will take you very far. To put things in perspective, the Asobi I wore during my swear-in ceremony cost me about 300 Delasi total. About 150 for 3 meters of fabric, and another 150 to get it tailored. Converted to US dollars, that's just over 6 bucks for a tailor-made collared shirt. In addition, last week while I was hungry and looking for something to eat, I got from a street vendor uh, what was basically a fried sandwich for 5 Delossi, or 10 cents. Compare that to dollar menu items in the States or other street food, you might be able to get something for a buck. And that's still ten times as expensive as what the equivalent in the Gambia costs. But that said, what I think is the crowning, most striking example of things being cheaper in the Gambia is alcohol. And the reason why I think this is most striking is because it's something that is clearly for the Westerners. It's clearly imported. It's not made by Gambians for Gambians. It's made by people who live outside the Gambia for tourists the Christian minority, and any closeted Muslims that want to drink in silence. You can buy whiskey, vodka, brandy, or pastis for 130 delasi, about $2.63. That's insane to me, that you can buy a full bottle of alcohol for less than three bucks in a country that does not cater to alcohol drinking. So yeah, the Gambian Delasi will take you far. And that said, I think it's also worth asking how much of this is out of necessity. Does the Gambian Delasi take you so far simply because it has to? Is it the cost of living so low because people couldn't afford everything else? That seems to be the case. And part of why it looks so amazing to me is at least to an extent my own privilege. I get paid a lot as a Peace Corps volunteer, at least by Gambian standards, by American standards, they quite literally don't consider it pay, they consider it a small allowance, but I've already been told that puts me in the top 1% of Gambian incomes. My privilege as a Peace Corps volunteer is insane, and bringing this full circle, when people in my village get diarrhea and vomiting, there's no Peace Corps vehicle that's going to come take them straight to the nicest hospital in the country and reimburse their stay for three to four days. The privilege is something that feels heavy to bear, but that said, I'm coming to the conclusion that it is something that I have to bear. It's very easy to think that privilege is this bad thing that we need to shirk, but honestly, I think I'm slowly learning that privilege is something that we need to share. If you shirk your privilege, if you do nothing with it, if you do what you can to throw away your privilege without giving it to anyone else, what you're doing is just as wrong as if you are keeping it all to yourself. And I'm going to be looking for ways that I can share my privilege with the people in my community. Now to wrap things up on a more happy note, I'm going to share with you something that got me really, really excited when I saw it a few weeks ago at the end of the Gambia River itself. Mudskippers. Mudskippers are a type of amphibious fish. Yes, that's right, amphibious fish. They crawl out of the water, swim along the mud, and can breathe cutaneously. That is, through their skin and the lining of their mouth, in the same way amphibians do. They don't have lungs, not like lungfish do, so they don't breathe in exactly the same way we do, but they do represent something that's fascinating. They represent a convergence, convergent evolution in the form of fish walking on land. There are people across the United States, particularly in the region that we grew up in, that would love to deny the existence of tectolic and the transition of sea to land. But that said, here, here in the Gambia, I get to witness a creature that represents that transitioning happening again 
in just just the way Tektalik did 375 million years ago. Or, not even. It's not even the way Tektalik did. These creatures have nothing in common with tetrapods other than this convergence. They're analogous, they're not homologous. Nothing about them looks tetrapedal. Nothing about their features are tetrapedal. They are 100% fish, and yet they make their lives on land. You can deny transitional fossils all you want, but here in the Gambia, I get to witness a living transition. A transitional fossil in the flesh. And that, that itself is a truly humbling, incredible experience. In closing, I'd like to give a shout out to another Peace Corps volunteer, Akshay who helped me get started on this vlog. He's been the head of media in the Gambia for the past few years, and he is now going home this month. So, good luck to you, Akshay. Hope to see you again, and hope you enjoy the vlog. And as for you, Zach, I'm gonna say what I always say. Ban again. Hope to see more from you in the future.